of the previous um, lecture notes. So, um, so here we are. So the question is that um, if you're looking at this iterative algorithm, which is an implementation of the factorial algorithm of the factorial function. Now remember fact factorial n is simply defined as n factorial, which is n times n minus one times n minus two, all the way up till three times two times one, okay? In other words, four factorial will simply be four times three times two times one, right? So the question is, um, if you have an iterative algorithm, uh, what is first of all the time complexity of this? Okay, can anybody um, volunteer to answer this? Khan. Sir, Sir Khan. G, uh, who's, I'm sorry, what is your name again? Heather. Heather, go ahead. Uh, is it O of N? Yes. So this should be fairly straightforward. This is order of N. Why is that? Well, simply if you look at the previous, what we covered last time, is that, uh, and one way to think about it, the simplest way, is that let's say you're calculating uh, four factorial, right? And this is what N is in this case. And now if you double this, so you're now calculating eight factorial, would the amount of time double or it would go up more than that, okay? Now you can see that the number of steps, the number of iterations is simply proportional to the value of N, okay? So if you're looking at two factorial, it's simply one times two. If you're looking at four factorial, it is uh, repeating itself four times, okay? And if you're calculating eight factorial, then it would go through this loop eight times because as you can see in this loop, you're going from range two to N plus one, okay? So approximately it's proportional to N. The number of iterations that you're doing is proportional to N. So clearly the time complexity, uh, which depends on the number of iterations that you're going through, uh, the number of uh, times you're going through this loop over here, this is order of n complexity, okay? Now, the next question is, what is the space complexity? Now, we haven't really spoken much about space complexity, and we'll talk specifically about space complexity today in terms of uh, data storage. So space complexity simply means the amount of space that this will use inside a computer's memory, okay? And we'll talk more about what is the computer memory and so on. But uh, let me explain this. So whenever you're defining a variable, for example, you're saying f is equal to one. So this is going to take up some space in memory, okay? It's like, you know, you have a table and you're taking a book and you're putting it on the table, right? So that book is occupying some space on your table. So similarly, when you define f is equal to one, this is going to take up some space inside the computer's memory, okay? Now, when you specifying the variable i, this is also going to take up some space, okay? So now, so far we've defined a variable f, uh, we've, we've already got a variable n, and we've already got a variable i, okay? Now, we're doing the computation within each one of these. We're not defining, are we defining any new variables as you go through this loop? So for example, if n is, is 10, and then we change n to be 100, are we going to be defining new variables or are we simply reusing those variables? Reusing. Reusing, okay. Um, please mention your name first. So reusing the variables. So in, it, in, a, Heather said, huh? yeah. so in a sense, as Heather is saying, that we, we're going to be reusing these variables and the only variables that we, the only memory that we're using is for three variables, n, f, and i, okay? And even if n goes to 100, uh, the amount of memory that's going to be used in the, in the computer's memory is not going to increase, right? We're going to be doing more processing. We're going to do it being more calculating, but we're simply going to be calculating based on those three variables, okay? So now the question is, what do you think is the space complexity? And I'd like, and I'd like to encourage, um, I'd like to say something. That as I said, uh, there is a variation in the in the background of students. So there'll be students in this class who will have a fair amount of computer science background, and there'll be students who have no background at all. So this course is basically meant for students who have no background. Of course, it's meant to challenge the ones who have background as well. But I would like to encourage those students who have no background to also speak up. 
Okay. That's a yeah. Uh, don't just rely on students who have a computer science background to give all the answers. Okay. So I'd encourage once again to for students who don't have a background to be able to answer. Okay. So once again, there is a problem with people speaking up um, without muting their mics. Uh, can you please make sure that doesn't happen? All right. So um, now what do you think is the space complexity? Somebody who doesn't have a computer science background. Try to think about it. Remember we-, we uh, spoke... Heather said one. Ji, Heather. Uh, I think it's O of one. Okay. Uh, that's, that's absolutely correct. It's O of one. Why is that? Because it doesn't depend on the variable N, okay? If N goes from 100 to 1,000 to a million, the amount of space that you're using the com computer's memory is not going to increase, okay? And uh, we'll talk more about this. If you don't understand this right now, this is what our lecture is going to focus on today, quite a bit, okay? So now, um, so that's the answer, order of N and order of one. Let's take now a recursive algorithm. As I said, a recursive algorithm is an, is an algorithm that solves a problem by having a function call itself, okay? Now, what does that mean? So if you look at this algorithm, factorial of n, now, if you just look at the structure of this algorithm, uh, if let's say you're calculating two factorial, right? That's two times one. If you're calculating three factorial, it's three times two times one. Okay, if you're calculating four factorial, it's four times three times two times one. So in a sense, you can see that there is a repetitive nature in this algorithm, in this function. Uh, it seems to sort of take a smaller value, smaller version of itself, and then it's adding on some more complexity, okay? So in a sense, it, you can define, uh, so, so now can you think about how could you define this in a recursive way? In a sense, uh, how could you define factorial n as um, a function that is a, call, that is a, a slightly modified version of itself? Can somebody suggest an answer? Somebody who hasn't actually done this before. I would prefer that. Sir, n times n minus one factorial. I am not hearing you. Sir, my name is Kuzmin Russian. Much better. Okay. n times n minus one factorial. Okay, uh -huh. excellent. So basically, as Kunoz has just said, that n factorial can be simply written as n times n minus one factorial. Okay, this is, should be quite obvious to everybody. So if it can be written as n times n minus one factorial, it becomes hopefully evidently clear that you can define factorial n as factorial of, factorial of n can be written as simply n times factorial of n minus one, okay? So in a sense, uh, it's, def it's being defined as a recursive function because it's calling itself. It's adding some additional uh, operations Okay, but it's calling a smaller version of itself with an argument which is now smaller. Okay, now if you de just define it but like that uh, in that sense, what do you think is the fundamental problem here? So it will go, uh, Daniel Habib. Uh, yes, Daniel. So it will only work once, I guess. Uh, it will only work well if you call f factorial n minus one. What will it do? in turn. So factorial n minus one will say, I'm going to do n minus one, and I'm going to ca calculate factorial of n minus two. You, you get that? So it's simply going to take the argument. This is the argument that you're providing it. And it's, uh, earlier, the argument that you're providing it was n, okay? So what it's done is it's taken this argument, it's placed it over here, and it's going to multiply it by uh, and give it a smaller argument to the same function, okay? So when you call f factorial of n minus one, what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to return n minus one, which is again the argument, 
okay? And it's going to multiply it by factorial of now n minus two. So it's reducing the argument by one further, okay? So you can see it's going to keep on going on and on. But what is the problem now? If you keep on defining something by yourself, uh, you know, be below. Uh, if we don't put a condition for it to stop, it will go to yeah. infinity. That's, that's the basic problem. So if you don't put a condition of where to stop, what's going to happen is going to end up going to negative infinity, right? So it's going to say, well, factorial of uh, four is four times factorial of three, four, and so on. And then eventually it's a, it'll say factorial of one is factorial of one times uh, factor, factorial of zero. Then it will say factorial of zero is zero times factorial of minus one. And then factorial of minus one will be minus one times the factorial of minus two. And it will keep on going till infinity. Okay, it will never stop. So if you ever write this, you will find out that the computer will just keep on working and working and working. And eventually, um, you know, you're going to have a control or delete or something to be able to break out of that loop. So now what's important is that whenever you have a recursive function, it's important to put a statement which will stop. So where do you think, how should we stop this factorial function? How should we stop it? So we can use a for loop with the... I'm not hearing you. Sir, my name is Sahir Batur. I think we can Please, give a range. Yeah, so how would you do it, Sarah? Sir, I'm not sure, like for giving range, there are different like types of examples yeah, so, that we can give. So so you're sort of thinking that let's it's do it in the dish. sense of, let's do it, so Sarah is suggesting that let's do it in the sense of for I in range. And then, but if you do a, a, something like this, that's sort of going in the iterative way, okay? we're not doing iteration, we're doing recursion. So it's simply, it's very simple. We're simply saying that factorial of n is actually n times factorial of n minus one. That's all we're saying. But now we need to put some condition for it to stop. And the question sir, is, how does it stop? Sir, Omar, am I there? Sir, Omar. Sir, uh, sir, sir, we will use Omar. this condition if n is equals to one or n is equals to zero, and Very then good. else, uh, else, and then we will return the value of the function. Perfect, perfect. So, so basically the idea is that we know that the factorial of one, factorial of one is actually equal to one. And in fact, that's basically one times factorial of zero. And in fact, the factorial of zero is defined by definition. This is a, when you put three, uh, three lines like this, it means by definition, okay? The factorial of zero is defined by mathematicians to be equal to one, okay? So, once you get a uh, factorial of zero, so basically what we, do, we now do, have to do is we have to put an if condition in the beginning. And we have to say, if the first thing we're going to test is, is n equal to zero. If n is equal to zero, then we're going to simply return a one. If n is not equal to zero, we're going to return n times factorial of n minus one, okay? So here's the, uh, the solution. Uh, we are defining a factorial and I'm calling it REC. So that means recursion it's going to take an argument n. So the first condition is going to be is n equal to zero. So that's the terminating condition. In the recursive function, you must have a terminating condition. If n is equal to zero, we're simply going to return one simply because factorial of zero is defined to be equal to one, okay? If it is not, then what we're going to return is n times the factorial of n minus one, okay? So I hope that that is clear. Um, does everybody follow this? Is any, if anybody doesn't follow, let me know now. Okay. Sir Abdullah, sir, up. Yeah, Abdullah. So uh, which part didn't you understand? Uh, if you can be more specific. So I, I don't want to just repeat everything. If there's some something- Sir Abdullah. Yeah, Abdullah. It's, some specific part of this algorithm that you don't understand. Anyway, I, I would prefer people to be more specific, but basically the algorithm is saying that you you're going to define factorial of n. Notice that factorial of n 
is also using itself. So this is the recursive function, okay? You're defining something and you're including yourself in it. But the difference is that you're not defining it, we're defining it with a different argument. The argument now is not n, it's n minus one. So basically it's going to call itself over and over again and the value of n will become smaller and smaller. Okay, so I hope that's um, clear. Uh, Good, sir, thank so you. When you when you're calling a function within a function, then it is already in a defining state. So how can you call a function with it when it has not been defined as yet? Okay. So good good question. So this is uh, uh, you know a lot of times if somebody says you know uh, you know in silly cases you know some you say uh, you ask a friend a question and he defines it by by defining it within itself it sounds kind of ridiculous okay and so in computer science uh, recursion sometimes to the layman sounds ridiculous that how can you define a function which when it hasn't been defined okay but here's how it will actually work okay. So uh, what will happen is when you, let's say, say factorial of four, what's going to happen is go, it's going to say, um, it's going to say, first of all, is n equal to zero, okay? So you give it the number four and it's going to say, is n equal to zero? So, so go through step by step what's going on. Is n equal to zero? No, all right? So it's going to go through the else function and then it's going to say return n times factorial of n minus one. So it's going to say, I'm going to return four multiplied by the factorial of three, okay? So I'm, I'm trying to answer exactly the question that you've raised. Now, factorial of three is not defined. So what's going to happen? Now the, the tricky part comes in. This part is actually going to stay in memory. It doesn't know how to solve this. So it's going to say, well, I don't know how to solve it. I'll keep it in memory. And I'll first, I'll try to solve this now, this function, okay? So now it's going to say, what's factorial of three? Well, factorial of three has been defined to be three times the factorial of two, okay? But I don't know what factorial of two is, all right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to keep this part also in memory. And I'm going to keep on waiting until I have an answer, okay? So I hope this is kind of now making sense. So it's not actually going to evaluate that expression, the full expression, until it's actually found something. It's keep on putting that into memory, all right? So in every, every case, the answer will be one. Sorry? Uh, so in every case, we, uh, the answer will be one. No. So it's not going to give an answer. When you ask it to calculate factorial of four, it's not going to give you an answer. It's going to keep that in memory, okay? And we'll go through exactly how this is happening uh, in more detail as we in the next few slides. But I'm giving you an overview right now. So it will say, I'm going to calculate factorial of four by four times factorial of three, I'm go I don't know what factorial of three is, so I'm going to put this whole thing into memory, okay? And then I'm going sir, to- Sir, Shaseeb, Shaseeb. Yeah. Sir, if we are gonna put that in the memory, shouldn't the space complexity not be one? Exactly, exactly. So you've jumped ahead of me. I haven't asked you the space complexity yet, okay? But you've got, you've hit the, the point on the head. Uh, the space complexity is not going to be one, okay? And we'll get to that in a few minutes. So it's actually taking more and more space. Okay, so now you're basically saying that it's going to take more space over here, and then it's going to calculate factorial of two, which is going to be two times this. This is going to be stored in memory. And then it's going to say what's factorial of one, then it's going to store this in memory. Eventually it's going to hit factorial of zero. Okay, then it's going to get to this point. It's going to say, aha, n is equal to zero. I know what that is. Okay, so it's going to return a number. Okay. Once it's returned a number, this number can now be put in over here. It knows what this is. Now it will calculate this to be equal to one times one is one. So it will put the answer over here as one. Then it'll say, aha, I know what f of one is. F one times two is going to be two. So now I know what factorial of two is, is two. And it's going to multiply that by three. That's going to give you six. So it says factorial of three is now six. And now I can eventually calculate what factorial of four is. It's four times six which is 24, okay? So you, you saw how it's actually taking up more and more memory as this number becomes larger. So for example, if instead of four, you have 10 or 100 or 1000, then this memory utilization would actually increase. So now can somebody tell me what would be the time and space complexity? Okay, so what about the time complexity?
Any thoughts? So I think time complexity will be often. I'm not hearing you. Heather, Heather, Sid Khan. Yeah, Heather. I think time complexity will be O of n and space complexity will also be O of n. Okay, very good. Does anybody agree or disagree? Nidal. Ji, Nidal. I think it's going to be 2n. It's going to be what? 2n. 2n, okay. So uh, the space complexity or the time complexity? Space complexity. Okay. Now, now remember when, when, I, when I defined uh, order of n, it basically meant that it the equation would be something like alpha, which is a constant, times n plus beta constant. Okay, so this is the formula for order of n. Now, if you saying order of two uh, n, then actually order of two n, uh, order of two um, n is the same as order of n. Okay, uh, people who are scribbling on the screen have realized that. Uh, you can write something on the screen, but I suggest you don't. Otherwise, it shows up on everybody's screen. So anyway, so order of 2n is the same as order of n. Why? Because you're simply changing the constant over here. Okay? So I think both of you are right. Uh, it could be order of 2n. It could be order of 200n. It would still be called order of n. Okay? Now let's take a deeper look at this for those of you who are still confused and lost, okay? So for, in order to understand uh, recursive algorithm, you need to first understand the difference between a queue versus a stack, okay? Now a queue is something called a first in first out queue, which is something which is very natural, right? Uh, you, go to, uh, you go to a restaurant and you stand in the queue Hopefully that's true in most places in Karachi and Pakistan, not true in every, uh, all places because some people try to cut the queue. But in most civilized places, let's put it this way, there is a first in first out queue, okay? People who come in late join the, at the end of the queue and somebody who came in first will be the first one to be served, okay? If you go to McDonald's or one of these foreign chains, they make sure that you, they're abiding by FIFO. If you go to the Desi uh, store someplace, the guy at the front will just accept whoever can lean the furthest and you know, give them the cash and that's not FIFO, okay? So first, first and first out queue. Um, another type of queue you might call it is what is called a stack, okay? A stack is what is referred to as a last in first out. That doesn't seem fair, right? But basically this says is, uh, and you can think of this as a set of dishes, okay? So if you have a dish piled up, and you pile up a lot of dishes. And uh, if you've ever gone, you know, if you've gone to a restaurant and you see a pile of dishes, well, the waiter comes in and puts in another, a bunch of dishes right at the top. So the first, the last dish which was put in by the waiter is the first dish which is taken off with the stack. Okay. And the first dish that is put in by the waiter is essentially the last dish. And if there aren't enough people to be served, then actually the the first dish is never really served, not used. So this is an example of a last in first out. So now if I ask you, if you think of the recursive algorithm, if you think of the way this is operating, do you think this is uh, an, um, a Q, first in first FIFO Q, is this called, this is called a FIFO, F-I-F-O, and this is called a LIFO, L-I-F-O, okay? So this is a FIFO discipline versus a LIFO discipline versus a DESI discipline, which is no discipline, okay? So um, is this um, a FIFO uh, discipline or is this a LIFO discipline? What, do you, what is your gut feeling? Uh, sir, I'm Guruzman Rashid. Uh, sir, this factorial function, I think it is a LIFO because the last number is multiplied first in yeah, the chain. Yeah. Yeah. Same. I also think that. Yeah, so your gut feeling is absolutely right. La the recursive algorithm is basically a LIFO. It's a stack, okay? Now let's try to see why that's actually true, okay? So uh, this is an example that I gave you, stack of dishes versus people queuing up at a restaurant. So let's take a look at how this would be calculated. So um, I don't know if I can remove this line over here. Just a second. Mm 
No, I think this can only be removed by the person who actually put in that line. Okay, so uh, people who randomly put in some of these lines, please try to remove them, okay? I don't know how to get rid of them. So let's say if you're calculating F4, which is four times F3, okay? Now, how would you calculate that? Basically, what would happen is the computer saves that in memory, and then it says, I'm going to now calculate F of three, okay? So F of three would be equal to three times F of two, okay? And it doesn't know what f of two is, so it will keep on going. So the stack would build up. Eventually, it would get to f of zero. Okay, and f of zero it knows is equal to one by definition. Okay, so what it's going to do is before that it had f of let's say one, which was one times f of zero. So if you look at it, it's piled up over here. Okay, so the queue is building up, and then eventually. Uh, it's going to come over here and it's going to say, well, I know what this is, so now I can remove this from the memory. So now you notice that this is LIFO. So this was the first dish in a sense, this was the first date. It was stacked. So you can think of this as a, as a stack, okay? You're putting this in the stack, but you're not taking it out, okay? Then you can, you're putting the next function on top of it and the next function and so on, all the way until you hit F of zero. Okay, so all of these things are piled up in memory. It doesn't know how to calculate any of them. And it's just waiting and waiting and waiting. Okay, and it's just using more and more memory. Eventually, when you hit F of zero, what it's going to do is that it's going to remove that from the stack. So it's going to say, I know what this is, so I'm going to remove that. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace this with one. The number one is going to come over here, okay? And then as soon as it's found that, it's going to start popping out. So this is sort of called a, a push function. So this is a push. It's pushing, pushing, pushing. And now over here, it's starting to pop the stack, okay? Now things are getting removed, 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 all the way up to here. So let me show this over here. So as you can see over here, you start by F4 is equal to four times F3. Um, again, people, have got the mute mics. And... So please make sure that your mic is muted. Um, so you go all the way, you've got all of this in the stack, F4, F3, F2, F1, until, until you get to F0. And then once you've got this answer, you've actually got a number that you can calculate, then you start removing this. So you're going to remove this and you're going to pop this out from the memory. So this memory is going to become clear. So this is using up the memory. Okay, so this got, so this is the maximum depth of this stack. Okay, and you can see that if the maximum depth is proportional to this number here. Okay, so if this number was instead of four, it was eight, then the depth of the stack would double. Okay, and, and if the depth of the stack would double, then the amount of memory that you're using up this is amount of memory, it would essentially double as well, okay? So, so this amount of memory that it's using is not constant. It initially starts off as very little, but as the process goes further in time, okay, so this is, I'm showing this stack evolving over time. Initially, the stack is building up. It's trying to calculate, uh, eventually it gets over here to calculate F of zero. This is where the stack is, uh, is of the maximum depth. And then you're going to start freeing up the memory. Okay, you're going to free up the memory and eventually you're going to free up all of this and it's going to F of four, is, which is four times six. And then it's going to clear this as well and it's going to return the number 24 as the answer. Okay, so this is showing you how a recursive function operates. And so hopefully now you would agree with me that the time complexity is order of N and the space complexity is also order of N as was suggested by one of you, okay? So is everybody clear on this? And if not, uh, I'm willing to repeat parts of it. Uh, sir, Nafisa. Uh, sir, I'm not clear about the time complexity. Okay, so why is the time complexity order of N? Okay, so would somebody like to explain that, Nafisa? 
Mr. Hader Sikh Khan. Yes, Hader. Yeah, the basically has. Try to reduce your your speaker so that when you speak, Hader. Sir, it's because more memory is taken up as an increase. No, the time complexity. Nafis is asking about the time, not the space complexity. Why is the time complexity order of n? So there's like a for loop. Yeah. So very simply put, there's a for loop, and the for loop goes from from i in range from two till n plus one. So that's almost um, you know, hopefully it should be self-evident by now that if you have a for loop, it's simply going to iterate through this n times or proportional to n times. So if n doubles, the number of times that you're going to iterate through that loop is going to double. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Okay. Yeah, Abdurman. Sir, can we use while loop as well? Okay, so can, can we use a while loop in the instead of the for loop in the iteration? Yeah, you could do, use the while loop. So uh, while is a slight modification of this. So uh, the while loop is present in most of uh, uh, most programming uh, function pro, uh, programs. And um, while simply says that you're going to keep on doing something until let's say uh, some Boolean variable is uh, true, okay? So while X, for example, is true or while X is equal to one, you're going to keep on repeating the loop, okay? So uh, how would you, well, I don't want to talk about while because I haven't really talked about it and it doesn't really add too much value, but yes, the short answer is yes, you could use a while loop instead of a for loop, okay? Okay, any other questions as far as the recursion and time and space complexity is concerned? Because now we're going to move on. Okay, so if not, um, hopefully um, this is clear. Now, name. Uh, name and question. I didn't get your question. Anyway, let's move on. Now I'm going to talk about uh, an important concept um, in, which is called abstraction, okay? And this is something which is true in everyday life as well. Um, and it basically means that you're going to, when, you, when you're working at a certain level of abstraction, you basically, what you're doing is you're reducing, you're trying to make things simple and you're not looking at subsystems um, in a lot of detail, okay? So it's best explained if I'll give you an example. So for example, if you're driving a car, all right? Now, if I try to start explaining to you how the engine works or even how the electrons and protons inside the every piece of your car works, obviously that is not going to be very helpful, right? When you're learning how to drive a car, you want to learn what's important at that level, okay? What you need to do, what you need to learn is how do I work with the, you know, the user interfaces? In other words, there's a steering wheel, there are pedals, there are rear view mirrors and so on. So you need to understand those things at that level of abstraction, okay? But, um, the steering wheel and the pedals are not going to work without an engine, right? But the question is, do you need to know how the engine works? You clearly don't, right? You, you can drive a car perfectly well without actually knowing, uh, you know, a single thing about how the engine works. And, you know, if the engine one fine day fails, you take it to hopefully to a mechanic and you don't have to open the hood as well, okay? It's good to know some things about the engine because when you, the car breaks down, you, you may not have a mechanic readily available. So it's good to know, but you don't have to know, okay? Especially when you're learning how to drive a car, that's the last thing you want to know is what's under the hood, okay? And the last thing you want to know is how the physics of, of you know, engines work. And if somebody starts explaining that to you, you're going to get extremely confused. Okay? You're going to say, just tell me how to drive a car, okay? So, this is called abstraction. So the highest level of abstraction is in driving a car is the user interfaces. 
a slightly lower level is knowing how the engine works. So at some point, maybe you need to know how the engine works, okay? But not all the time. When, you, when you're at this level of abstraction, you simply need to know how the user interface works, okay? At some point, uh, maybe once you've learned this, you need to know, you need to go dive deep, uh, do a deep dive, and you need to know how the engine also works because of what happens if you get stuck on the, on the road, okay? And at some point, maybe you also need to know how electrons and protons in the engine work, okay? If you're a physicist especially, or if you're going through a PhD program and uh, you're doing a PhD in physics, then you would like to know how the electrons and protons in your engine also work, okay? But clearly not all the time. So, um, so similarly in computer science, you always have a level of abstraction. In other words, I'm not going to talk to you about every level all the time, okay? Because you would simply get confused. So when I'm talking about algorithms, uh, what did I focus on in the first lecture? Can now somebody try to relate it? How would you, say at the at, when you're talking about algorithms what um what is the way to best learn algorithms and how did i teach it if you remember the first lecture first couple of lectures perhaps so uh, what technique did i use G, G, exactly so i use a flow chart right so flow charts are best to explain the logic of an algorithm Okay, um, and then um, when you were familiar with flowchart, what did I do next? I went one level below, and what did I do next? Ramaya, my dear, said trace tables. Trace tables, very good. So I actually showed you uh, that's a very good example that I actually showed you how to uh, diagnose the uh, the flowchart. Okay, so you could call it trace tables or what have you. Okay, but using an array and to be able to see how the the variables were going as as they're going through the loop, how they're working out. Okay, what was next after that? What did I do? What one of the things that I did? So did I go below that? Did I go to to a lower level of abstraction. Complexity. Okay, complexity. Um, yeah, complexity is it? But uh, but besides complexity. Complexity might be considered to be still at the level of the algorithm, okay? So complexity is not really going lower in the abstraction level. It's still at the algorithm level. So uh, you're looking at the algorithm and you're looking at the complexity, it's sort of parallel, perhaps, okay? But uh, during the trace, tracing is definitely one level lower, okay? What was even lower than that? We used an actual programming language. Yes. As Mars said, you actually, we actually did a programming, uh, we used a programming language and we actually programmed it in Python. Okay. So you could see that I went all the way down to Python over here. So this could be lower level. This could be, you could say tracing was one level uh, lower in the abstraction. And then actually, finally, we actually programmed it. Okay. And these uh, are so will we include space complexity in lowest level? So space and time complexity, I would say is still at the algorithm level, okay? So you're trying to understand the algorithm uh, and you're trying to understand its space and time complexity. Uh, it would still be at the top level. So if you have a flow chart, um, you could actually, um, but okay, so let me take that back. It depends on the how you implementation, implement it. Okay, so let's say if you implement it in an iterative way, the, uh, the space complexity would be order of constant. But if you implemented it in a recursive manner, then the space complexity would be order of n. Okay, but that might actually come out <coughs> of the chart. So if you, your flow chart, if you're implementing it in a, in a recursive way, that should show up in your flow chart. Was there a question? Okay. So at the flow chart level, you should be able to understand the space and time complexity. So I would um, tend to say that uh, complexity, space and time complexity is still at the highest level of abstraction, okay? Any further questions? Okay, so um, 
I'm showing you a slightly different version of this, and I've skipped sort of the trace table over here. The tracing could still be over here, but um, a lower level of abstraction below programming would be the hardware level. Okay, and then of course there are multiple levels within the hardware level, which we'll get into as we go through this course. But uh, very broadly speaking, you could say that if you're talking at the flowchart level, this is the highest level of abstraction. Then if we go down to a programming like language implementation, it's the next lower level of abstraction. And the lowest level could be a hardware implementation where you actually need to figure out what are the bits and the bytes uh, of the actual implementation, okay? And that's something that we will now next look at. All right, so I hope the concept of abstraction is clear. And the, the, the basic advantage of abstraction is that it allows you to focus on what is important at every level, okay? So I'm simply, uh, so when I'm talking about uh, uh, the concepts over here, for example, then I will try not to talk about these lower and higher levels, okay? Because I will simply be foc focusing on this abstract there. So the concept of layers is also very important and will become also very important when we talk about data communications, which is also part of this course, okay? You'll see this concept of layers coming in repeatedly. Right, so having spoken about the concept of abstraction, now, uh, what I'm going to do in this course, as I mentioned earlier on, is that I started off by talking about algorithms, okay? Now, in the book, what you'll see is that they generally follow a simpler approach. They start at the hardware level and they go, they sort of go upwards, okay? That's not my personal approach. My personal approach is I like to focus on something which is the most critical part of this course, okay? And in fact, of the entire computer science curriculum. Uh, that is to focus on algorithm, okay? If you know your algorithms very well, then you're a fantastic uh, developer, programmer, and so on, okay? You don't, and you'll generally be sitting right at the top. So people who are the best developers, best programmers, and who are the best thinkers, so let's say at Google or Facebook or what have you, they're the people who actually develop the algorithms, okay? And then they can give it down to somebody below them to somebody junior and they will actually implement that in a particular programming language, okay? And then, um, and doesn't necessarily mean that the person who's at the top is the highest paid and the person who's at the hardware level is the lowest paid, not necessarily true. People at the hardware level do fantastic jobs and they get fantastic salaries as well. But it's simply showing you the way things work, okay? That if you're writing a program, then it's very important to have the concepts clear first, how, what the algorithm is going to be and then you can start implementing it in a programming language. Now in a computer science degree, as opposed to let's say an electrical engineering degree, in an electrical engineering degree, of course, the hardware level becomes very important because that's what they're focusing on. They're trying to figure out how the hardware works. And if you're a physics major, then it's all the way at the bottom. You're not only looking at the hardware, you're looking at actually how the physics works, okay? But uh, in this course and in this curriculum, let's say in a computer science degree, uh, we won't be paying too much attention to the hardware. It's good to know it, okay? But your focus will primarily be in programming um, and maybe some of that could be firmware level programming, which uh, you'll learn later on, but it's generally on the software side. And that's why it's called uh, computer science. And, um, and people, some people that you might know at NED and other places, they might be focusing more on the hardware level, okay? So that's why I've started off with focusing on algorithms, but now I'm going to switch gears whenever needed, and I'm going to go down uh, to the uh, you know lower levels. For example, I'll, I'll, I've already given you exposure of programming languages, and I'll keep coming back and forth between these levels, but you should know at what level I'm, I'm talking to, right? At any, in any given lecture, okay? So now what I'm going to do is switch gears, and I'm going to start going a little bit deeper. Okay, because now we're talking about space complexity. And uh, in order to really understand what space complexity means, you need to be able to understand what does it mean to actually, when I say that a particular variable uh, is going to use a certain amount of space, right? Uh, what does that mean? So I, as I said over here, N is using a certain amount of space. F is using a certain amount of space. I is using a certain amount of space. But what does that mean? Okay, how much space is that? So now we're going to shift gears and we're going to start talking about the lower level 
slightly at the hardware level and slightly above that, okay? So um, now let's take a look, as I say, under the hood, okay? And I'm not going to spend too much time on under the hood on the hardware, but these are a lot of the components that you might already be familiar with, okay? And specifically, uh, let's focus on a little bit on the motherboard, uh, on the hard drive, on the uh, processors, on the RAMs, okay? So hopefully most of you are familiar with all of these because you've been using computers, but at the heart of the computer is something called the motherboard, okay? And within the motherboard, basically you have a lot of components, okay? And one of the things that I'm going to focus on initially, I'm not going to look at all of these, but let's just focus in on the, the processor, which is going to be important uh, as we go forward. And uh, this is sort of the heart of the computer. And also look at the memory, okay? So this is one type of memory, which is uh, used over here. And there are other types of memories as well. So let's take a look at the different types of storage that are present in computers, okay? So you might have already been familiar with this. So for example, the hard drive. So your computer might have a one terabyte hard drive or two terabyte. You can easily get a five TB of hard drive. What does a TB mean? I'll get to that in a few minutes for people who are not familiar with that, okay? And the hard drives are generally the slowest, right? Uh, the random access memory is the fastest and it also doesn't have too much space. And the ROM can be thought of as something which is, um, which is also on directly accessible, but the difference between RAM and ROM, as the term can sort of uh, indicate, is that the random access memory can be changed, okay? The ROM is read-only. So once, you, once the manufacturer writes something into the ROM, it cannot be changed, okay? So it's use, usually useful when you are booting the computer. So when you start the computer, everything in the, in the RAM is erased, okay? The hard drive is too far away. It doesn't access that. So it loads the, the instructions from the ROM, okay? And then once it's loaded the instruction, the basic instructions, then it starts using the RAM and starts using the hard drive, okay? Now, the RAM is the only thing which is volatile in the sense that when you turn off the computer, the stuff on the hard drive remains, it's saved. The stuff in the ROM is always there. It can't even be changed, but the RAM disappears, okay? So the way the RAM is populated is that it takes stuff from the hard drive and it puts it on the random access memory, okay? So this very roughly is what these three components are. In a layman's terms, you can think of, uh, if I were to draw an analogy, let's say you're sitting on your computer, uh, on your desk, okay? You're sitting on your desk and you're working on, on, your, uh, on your desk and you have a shelf, okay? So you have a filing cabinet and you've got a bunch of data, you've got a bunch of files, let's say all your, um, your files are put in a filing cabinet, okay? Once you come onto your desk, your, initially your desk is clear, okay? Hopefully, for a lot of people it's not clear, but let's assume that your desk is clear. So desk can be represented by a random access memory, okay? And your hard drive can be represented by your filing cabinet. So what happened, and your ROM can be thought of is what's inside your brain, okay? So you've got stuff inside your brain. Hopefully that doesn't clear out every time, every morning you, when you sit down on your desk and you start working, you've got a clear desk and you say, well, what am I going to work on today? So let's say you, say you decide that you're going to work on introduction to computing homework assignment. So the introduction to homework, uh, let's say it's the old fashioned way and everything was on a physical file. You took that from the filing cabinet and you placed it on the, on your desk, okay? And you started working on it, okay? Now, why didn't you, why did you place the files on your desk? What's the reason why, why didn't you work directly from your filing cabinet? Can somebody explain that? Sir, it's more accessible. Ji, Shahzib, say that again. To make it more accessible. Accessible, exactly. What's in, fr in front of, on your desk is easy to work with, right? So if you've got uh, files open over here, you can work with them immediately. Why wouldn't you want to work with your filing cabinet? Because it's very far, right? It takes you, you know, 30 seconds to walk over there and get it back. 
So that's the same concept of the hard drive. There's a lot of stuff. So in the, in the filing cabinet, you can have a lot more stuff, okay? But it's slow, okay? So this is the slowest. And you don't want to work on, you, if, you, if you're trying to do some processing, you're trying to do some calculations, you don't want to work with your hard drive. That's like working from your filing cabinet. It's just take too slow. It'll just take too long. So you put everything on your desk and then you've got everything in front of you and you start working, okay? Now, in a sense, the RAM is also faster. So you can think of your desk as giving you a fast response. You can immediately read that, okay? So hopefully that analogy between the RAM being the, the desk and your hard drive being the filing cabinet is clear and your ROM being your brains, which hopefully have some stuff in there and the, you retain it every morning. And uh, there's also a difference in terms of capacity. So hard drives can be a lot bigger, uh, RAMs will be smaller, and typically ROMs are even smaller, okay? Uh, ROMs are not very useful these days and they've been mostly been replaced by other technologies. Okay, so I hope that analogy is clear. Now let's talk about, uh, we often refer to these as terabytes, gigabytes, kilobytes, okay? So I've got a nice chart over here for those of you who may not remember. So if I talk about n and 10 to the power n, okay? So if for n is equal to zero, that's 10 to the power zero, which is equal to one. So one byte is, you can think of it, that's how a single character is stored, okay? And I'll talk more about that in the coming slides. Um, if you have n is equal to three, which basically means that you have 10 to the power three or 1000, okay? So this is 1000 bytes, that's referred to as a kilobyte. And that's typically the size of what I refer to as cache memories. And we'll talk more about that later on. If you have n is equal to six, that becomes 10, uh, 1 million bytes. That's referred to as a megabyte. And that's typically the size of a ROM, okay? Uh, if you talk about n being nine, that's 10 to the power nine, which is a gigabyte. That's typically the size of RAMs, okay? So for example, on my computer, I have, I think, 16 gigabyte of RAM. And that's very important for making sure that your computer is fast because that's like saying, you know, how big is your desk? And if you notice that, you know, the bigger, the more um, important you are in the company, uh, the bigger the desk will be. So you start off the first day when you're employed, you'll have a small, tiny desk, but eventually, and you go into your CEO's office and you'll have a nice big desk. Why is that? Because that's essentially like saying he has more RAM and you have less RAM, okay? Because RAM is expensive and that, occupies a lot of space in the office. Um, terabyte is 10 to the power 12, okay? So that's 1,000 gigabytes. And that's the size of hard disks. So as I said, one TB, two TB, those are typical. So right now, my thing, I think my hard disk is one TB or two TBs. Uh, if you go into the market, you should be able to buy a hard disk for, but, or external hard disk for five, uh, five TB capacity, okay? Of course, the cost keeps going. Um, if you make n is equal to 15, 10 to the power 15, that's called a petabyte, okay? And that's um, the amount of data that Google processes per day, okay? So that's a lot of data. Uh, if you go 10 to the power 18, that's a thousand petabytes. That's the size of major data centers. So that's the amount of data generated every day worldwide, okay? So the entire world, the amount of data that people are generating, including people who are uploading movies, people like me who are uploading um, one hour lectures every other day, and people who are uploading all kinds of stuff. That's the amount of data that is generated every single day. It's in exabytes, okay? Zettabyte, that's 10 to the power 21. Now, these, some of these numbers weren't even, didn't even exist a few years ago, but this is, approximately the amount of data in the entire, online data in the entire world, okay? It's in the hundreds of zettabytes. And I'm sure very soon, maybe even today as we're talking, things have gone into the zettabytes. So this was the last year they were saying that the amount of data worldwide online is about a few hundred zettabytes, okay? Zettabyte, people haven't really started using zettabyte, but the way things are going, uh, I won't be surprised if uh, by the time you graduate, uh, people are already talking about your bytes. Okay, so this you this gives you a scale of you know the scale of memory uh, that is in use already. Um, now let's take a look at what is called data encoding. Okay, 
So initially I said a particular variable. So I said n is being stored in the memory. Okay. Now n was an integer. Okay. N was a number between, and I hope you all can remember what an integer is. Integers are whole numbers like 1, 2, 64, and so on. Okay. Now these can use anywhere between two and eight bytes. If you're using two bytes, you will the largest number will be smaller. And if you're using eight bytes, the largest number that the largest integer you can represent will be larger. Okay. If you want to use, if you want to save a single character, for example, if you want to save the letter A, then it can be stored as a single byte. Okay. So if you look at this, for example, the letter H can be stored as a single byte. Okay. These are called uh, encodings. And the most popular encoding is referred to as the ASCII encoding. Okay, it's the American character set. The UTF-8 is also another encoding. So let me just show you uh, the, the ASCII code. So this is an ASCII code, okay? So uh, earlier you saw that the letter H had this encoding, 0, 1, double, 0, 1, triple, 0, okay? So basically this meant that this is eight bits. So you have eight bits is equal to one byte, okay? So each one of these is a single bit. And you, if you count these, there are eight bits in it. And if you look at the letter H inside the ASCII code, uh, let's see, where is it? It's right over here, okay? And you can see that the code, the binary representation for this is zero, one, double, zero, one, triple, zero. So that occupies a single byte in memory, okay? Consisting of eight bits. Right, so um, so when you are using a single uh, byte, you can represent all these numbers. So you can represent, for example, all the letters A through the capital letters. I've got different encodings. You can see the capital A has a different encoding. Okay, the lowercase A, if you can find it over here, the lowercase A has a different encoding. Okay, and um, there are a lot of other things as well. For example, all the numbers between zero and nine have got encoding. So the number zero is not represented by num by all zeros, okay? The number zero is represented in ASCII. It might have a different encoding in other encodings, but in ASCII, it's represented at, by zero, zero, one, one, and then four zeros, okay? And then you might ask, what are these other things? So these are what are referred to as control characters, okay? So for example, when you hit the letter escape, okay? If you hit the, the key is the, on your keyboard, if you hit the, the, the escape key, then actually that corresponds to this particular uh, encoding in memory, okay? That corresponds to triple zero one, one zero one one, okay? So those are referred to as, um, as ASCII encoding, and that's not the only type of encoding. And some of you might wonder, if I'm using eight bits, am I using all um, the numbers that I have available in eight bits? So eight bits corresponds to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, um, and if you notice over here, it's going from all zeros, but uh, it's going up till over here, it's not going all the way up till, it, the first digit is always zero. So, th so uh, you can think about what's going on, but it's actually not using all the encodings. And when you, when you change this to a one, it uses for foreign keys and special characters, okay? So that's called uh, ASCII encoding. Now, if, you, if, you're writing the if you're writing a string, so for example, when you write hello world, then it's basically a bunch of characters put together, okay? So each one of these will correspond to a single byte and so this will take, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and then the space will also be uh, 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 encoded. So if you see somewhere over here, there'll be encoding for space. And so this will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. So this will take 11 bytes at least. Okay. Uh, if somebody's got the mic on, kindly turn it off. Okay, so now you understand what a string is. Somebody has again got the mic on. So let me see if I can turn them off. Mute all. Okay, so 
let's get back over here. Uh, if you have a float and double, that might take, that might have a different encoding. So let's take a look at uh, how that can be encoded. So let's first of all, take a look at binary numbers. So let's take a look at an integer, okay? Um, integer is perhaps the simplest to understand. And what it does is it uses what is called the binary numbering system, okay? Now, for those of you who are not familiar with binary numbering system, think of the decimal numbers, okay? So when you write a number, let's say the number 35,628, what you're basically saying is that the least significant number here is basically has to be multiplied by 10 to power zero, which is basically one. This number two has to be multiplied by 10. The number six has to be multiplied by 100, which is 10 power two. The number five has to be multiplied by 10 to power three, which is a thousand, so that's 5,000. And then three has to be multiplied by 10 to power four, which is 30,000, okay? So the binary system simply changes the base from 10, keeps everything else the same, and it simply replaces the base two to be two, okay? So now if you represent the number, for example, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, then it corresponds, then you will calculate it, you will convert it into a decimal number as follows. So this will correspond to one times two power zero, which is one, okay? So that's number one. This will correspond to zero times two, which is again zero. This will correspond to zero one times two to the power two, okay? So this will correspond to two times two is four. This will be another zero, zero, and this will correspond to one times two to the power five, which will correspond to one times two to the power five, which is 32, okay? So this is how you'll actually convert a binary number into a decimal number, okay? So it'll be one, one, uh, one, four, and one thirty-two. Okay, so that comes out to be number 37. So hopefully, if you haven't seen this before, uh, if you do a little bit of practice, it shouldn't be very difficult, all right? Now, let's look at a floating point number. Uh, let's see how much time we have left. We've got a few minutes left. Let's just do floating point numbers and then we'll stop. Now, floating point number is a little tricky. It's a little different. What it does is it breaks up. So let's say you are using a floating point number, which is uh, using four bytes, okay? So if you're using a floating point number and using four bytes, that means the length of this number is four times eight. Remember each byte corresponds to eight bits. So it has four times eight, 32 bits. Now the 32 bits are shown over here as zero to 31. It uses zero to 22 for what is called the mantissa, okay? And I'll explain that in a minute. So this is the mantissa. Then it uses the next portion. So it's broken this number up into three different areas. This is called the exponent and this is called the sign, okay? So if you have a one over here, that means this is a negative number. If you have a zero over here, that means it's a positive number, okay? Now let's try to figure out what this number is. So this number represents a, a number in, as a binary integer. Can somebody tell me what this, the mantissa corresponds to? Which decimal number does this correspond to? So one, one, one zero. Five. Five. Heather five. saying this is a five, very good. So this is a five. Uh, can somebody tell me what this corresponds to, the exponent? That's a one, one over there in case, can't see this clearly. It's three. Yeah, okay, so that's a three. Um, so now if you use this uh, equation, can somebody tell me what this floating point number corresponds to? So it's minus 3.5. So it's minus 3.5. Uh, does anybody agree or disagree? Hello, sir. Uh, G. Sorry, this is minus. I'm here, sir. Uh, Three multiply by ten. Ten is ten is power five. Okay, so I think Sami, uh, whoever answered that, that uh, I think you said minus three times. Times what? Ten Time, to power. Ten to the power five. Does anybody still agree or disagree? 
Sir, shouldn't it be minus five multiplied by two? Okay, please say your name so I know who's speaking and I can ask you to speak. Yeah, go ahead. So, Maaz, Maaz, please go ahead. Shouldn't it be two to the power of five? Three to the power of five. I'm still not. I'm saying, shouldn't it be two to the power of five instead of ten to the power of five? Ah, yeah. Now you got it. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't quite get you. So yes, so this should be two to the power of five. Okay. So what Mars is saying is should be minus three. Okay. So you why is it minus? Because minus one to the power of the of the sign bit. That's minus one to the power of a one, which is a minus one. So you have minus one multiplied by the mantissa, mantissa was a three, and then two to the power of the exponent. So the exponent was a five. So this should be the correct answer. Sir, okay. shall they prove the mantissa was five in the... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I got that wrong, okay. Yeah, thanks for correcting me. So the mantissa was a five and the exponent was a three. So it's minus one times five times two to the power three, which is what? What's the answer? In decimal? Five times eight, so that's minus 40. Okay. So is everybody clear on how we got minus 40? Yes, sir. Okay. So basically this is what we've done. This is how we've calculated. Now you might say, well, what if I want to represent the number um, 0 0.5, okay? Or some number which is a fraction. Well, the exponent actually, I haven't neglected that. The exponent also has a sign bit. So you can actually, the exponents can go from minus 126 to 127, okay? That's because it has eight bits. So you can only have 255 numbers or you can have minus 126 to 127. So if the exponent is minus, you will get a fraction. Okay, so that's how you can represent essentially any floating point number.